Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You guys can be seated. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, team. You are so awesome in what you do, how you do it. It just amazes me. He is the way maker, the miracle worker. Light in the darkness. <laughs> that has a whole new meaning to me. <laughs> Light in the darkness. Oh, my. When there's nothing but darkness around, it's wonderful to have some light. I, I know that's not a revelation to anybody, but it sure does matter, doesn't it, in life. And God is that light in our life, and uh, it matters. It really does for us. All right, praise the Lord. All right, you guys ready? You know what we're on. This is really our, our last shot. I, I, I think it's our last shot. And our little series about let's talk about grace. Uh, grace, God's grace is the wonderful aspect of God that allows us to desire God and to enter his presence without being uh, intimidated by it. It's his, uh, it's his ability to give us things that we don't deserve, and this is what God is known for. This is what the Bible presents God as. Even when God presents himself, he says that he is full of grace first, and truth. God is truth, but, but, but it's seen through the eyes of grace. And so we've been talking about grace and what it's all about and how to receive him because, uh, and, and I hope you, know, you don't get tired of this phrase, but it's just, it's just a, a way to identify uh, the con why it's important to understand grace and, and why you would preach or teach or why the Bible's filled with instructions about grace. It's because none of us ever get closer to God then our concept of God will allow us to. What we think about God determines how close we come to God, determines how often we come to him, and what kind of things we bring before him. If we think he's uh, some ogre in heaven that's just looking to judge us and is trying to find some way to put the hammer on us all the time, then we're gonna be reluctant to come to him. We're gonna run from him instead of to him we're not gonna crawl up into his lap and say, Daddy, I love you, I can't handle this. Can you handle this for me? Like he wants us to, according to Hebrews 4. That's what he wants to be to us, Papa. He said, call, call me Abba. <laughs> Abba, which means Papa. So I've been on a little four or five week campaign here to encourage us to think about God in the right way because it really matters in our life. And last week, I dove off into something that uh, I wasn't sure exactly how it was gonna work out, but I felt I needed for us to, to consider this, and it's, it's weakness. I mean, we all have weaknesses, right? I mean, there are things that are uh, in our lives or about our lives that are cracks in our armor. Um, we're not, we're not uh, perfectly strong in. We, we're in, incapable in, in some areas of our life. We, we all have certain weaknesses in our life. And last week, I basically sought to uh, present to you the purpose for weakness. I mean, why, why do we have weakness? Why does God allow weakness? Why does God even at times create weaknesses himself as he did in the apostle Paul and his thorn in the flesh? Some of them are permanent, some of them are temporary. But God sometimes does these things and they can be very frustrating and very difficult to understand uh, if you don't understand them through the eyes of grace. That it is for our good and it's for our best and our improvement and it's because he loves us so deeply. So the conclusion last week was that there's a big difference between the way God looks at weakness and the way people look at weakness. People look at weakness as, as a liability. God looks at weakness as a way or an opportunity to show himself mighty in your behalf because your weaknesses and God's strength uh, just per, are, are a perfect match for each other. So God is not repulsed by our weakness. God is attracted to our weakness because it's how he shows himself in our life and how he works in our life to change our life and manifest our life. It is through 
Those, the weakness that we most often come to God and seek God and want and talk to God and get in his presence. It's about something that's happening in our life that's beyond our control that we need a God like him to be able to handle. So God loves the weaknesses and, and he works through them. Now, with all that in mind, um, with your weakness and, and God's uh, strength being a perfect match, uh, <clears throat> What do we do with, with our weakness? Well, I, I'm going to go through this quickly, but I want to show you these three things. Uh, I've just boiled it down to the way human, people, human beings respond to weakness. Here, here are basically the three ways that I've seen as a pastor that people generally handle weakness. All right, here's the first one. G they give up. Um, People just uh, avoid the rush and surrender early. I mean, <laughs> I mean I, hey, no need to fight it. I'm not big enough. Let's just, uh, okay. Uh, and they surrender to this, their, their, their weakness. I mean, just give it up. In John chapter five, and I know you guys are familiar with the story of the, of the lame man who was laid on one of the porches. There were five porches around this pool of water. And this pool of water, it was said that, uh, that in, the, in a certain season, an angel would come down and stir the water, and whoever was first into the pool was made well of whatever disease he had. Well, this guy had been laying there 38 years. That's a long time, 38. That means... 38 times at least, and possibly even multiple times of the year, this event happened. And he had been laying there for 38 years, waiting for the angel to stir the water and to get in the water. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but it, it just dawned on me, you know, it seems like over a period of 38 years, if you really wanted to get in that water, somehow you, you would have gotten in the water. My, my point here being that it was not only this man's body that was weak, it was his will that was weak. It was his heart that was weak. He, his mind had given up, is what I'm presenting to you, and that is exactly why when Jesus came upon him, and the Bible says Jesus clearly knew how long he had been there, looked at him and said, um, the old King James word language, wilt thou be made whole? Which is almost like, I'm thinking, that's a dumb question, but there are, God asks no dumb questions. Uh, sure, he wants to be made well. He's been laying there 38 years to, in order to try to get well. Jesus, what else do you think he wants besides being well? But I think Jesus was asking him, hey, man, you've given up. You don't even try anymore. Are you sure this is what you want? So there are some people that just give up, just quit with their weaknesses. And maybe they think they're not qualified. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've known I'm not qualified. And I've gone to the Lord in all kind of incidences and said, God, I'm not qualified. And he says, I know you're not qualified. It's my grace that makes you qualified. You're not qualified, but it's my grace that makes you qualified. So my grace qualifies you because performance is about us. Grace is about God. Here's the second thing people do. They cover up. Um, they get deceptive about things. Um, covering up my weakness and pretending that my weakness doesn't exist. You know, Jesus hated the deception of the Pharisees. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you guys are whitewashed sepulchers, which just means... Uh, you walk around here like you're something special, but you're really full of death. The first act in the Bible, the first thing that God did in connection with this world is God said, let there be light. And the reason he said that is because God always works in the light. God never works in the darkness. God does. God works in the light. It, the devil works in the darkness. And everywhere the devil is, is working, he's covered it with darkness. 
And his darkness is called fear and shame. And when he introduces the darkness of fear into shame and fear and shame into situations, you know what it causes us to do? It causes us to hide to hide our works, to hide from each other, to hide from God because of this dark fear and shame, to pretend that we're something we're not, to try to fool God, to try to fool other people into thinking that that we're something special when we're really uh, full of shame and full of fear. God can't help us when we are pretending. God cannot fix who we pretend to be. Here's what James, the book of James, has to say about it in chapter five, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Did you know that there are some things in your life that God is not going to heal unless you tell somebody? Now, you don't have to tell everybody. Please please understand that. You don't need to tell everybody, but there are many things we need, we, we need to come clean. We need to open up and quit trying to hide, and we need to tell somebody and don't try to cover things up. That's darkness. That's where the devil lives. A third thing that people do is they blow up. And by that, I mean they become defiant. Rather than accepting something in my life as a weakness or something that is below the mark, that is not as high as it should be, I can just declare it acceptable. (laughs) You know, hey, this is not sin, Uh, this is acceptable. And I can just declare that it's acceptable rather than change it, just... uh, say it's all right, and then defy God if he says it's wrong or anybody else if they say it's wrong. And, and that's, that's, you know what that is? That's, that's the Cain spirit. You remember Cain in the Bible? Two human beings born on the earth, the first two human beings born on the earth. You do know that Adam and Eve were not born, right? When you get to heaven, you will not see a belly button on Adam and Eve because God created them. Cain and Abel were the first two humans. They were brothers. And you know the story of how they came and brought their offering to God. And Abel brought the the best of his flock, the perfect lamb, and, and 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 he slew the lamb and he brought the blood and he presented it to God and God accepted Abel's offering. Cain was a farmer. Cain went out into the field and got some of his vegetables and he brought them back to God. Now, I don't know if these were the best vegetables he had or not. I don't know if he just haphazardly uh, just picked the first ones on the row or, and they weren't really the best. Uh, but God didn't receive them. God said, no, no, that's not an acceptable offering. First thing, it wasn't blood, you know. But, but, it, but he looks at Cain and he says, Cain, I'm, I'm going I'm to give you a, a, another chance to make this right. And Cain, rather than being humble and repentant, got mad, got angry. And here's what God said to him. I want you to hear what he said. Genesis chapter four, verse six and seven, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? Look, if you do well, you will, will, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. What was Cain's response to what God said? He killed Abel. You're not going to tell me what to do. That's the Cain spirit. The world we're living in today is filled with that spirit. Our world is trying to cleanse itself from any element of God. Anything that points in God's direction, any 
good, any moral, anything that promotes any value of discipline and family, the world hates it and just, just rallies to kill it. That's the Cain spirit. If you do well, you will be happy. And if you do not well, sin crouches at the door ready to spring on you and devour you. To devour your, your, your happiness, to devour your usefulness. And that's what sin will do. If you do well, if you repent, if you, if you change around, if you turn your direction, then every, you're going you're gonna to be received. I'm going to receive you just like I received Abel. But if you don't do well, I'm going to tell you what's happening. Sin is right there. And as soon as you walk out that door, sin's going to jump on you and devour you and ruin your life and spoil your life. Because that's what sin does. But my desire is that you rule over it that it wouldn't rule over you. So, how do you rule over the weaknesses of your life? If you, if you don't, you know, if you don't cover them up, if you don't hide behind them and you, and, and, and you don't uh, get defiant and, 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 and try to be uh, angry with everybody who tries to work in your life in any way to correct something that might help you, how do you work with weaknesses in your life? Well, there are three things, three necessary understandings that I think we have to face our weaknesses with. And they might seem a little bit odd at times, but just hang with me, all right? You might say, Pastor, I, man, I don't know. You might be, you're wrong about that. Just hang in there. Just wait until, wait until we get all the way through, all right? Because sometimes it's gonna sound a little funny when I say it. All right, three necessary understandings for change in our life. Number one, understanding number one. Understand the corrupt and incorrigible nature of your flesh. The corrupt and incorrigible. You know what incorrigible means, right? Incorrigible means, incorrigible means it can't be changed. If you are incorrigible, it means it's a waste of time trying to change you. You cannot be changed. Our flesh is incorrigible. Resident within you and me is fallen flesh that will be there until Jesus comes. We're on this earth and we have resident in ourselves an element called flesh. And that flesh is with us until Jesus, I wish when we got saved, God took our flesh out, but he doesn't. He just leaves it in there. And it is unchangeable. You cannot alter it. It is going to fight you all the way in every situation. You need to understand that. You're never gonna, it's never gonna be easy to do right. Let me just read you what Paul has to say. I, when I was talking a while ago about the strongest person that's ever lived besides Jesus, I was talking about the Apostle Paul. I mean, and here's what Paul, in Romans 7, have you, ever, have you, you guys read Romans 7 lately? If you have, you, you'll, you'll testify with me, that is the most frustrating passage in the whole Bible. It is. If you just go home and, and read it, get get your Bible and read it out loud. I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read half of it here, so you can kind of get to hear some of it. But if you read it in the King James, it's really, it's really frustrating. I'm gonna read it out of the message because I want you to understand what it's saying. All right, Romans 7, Paul is talking about his struggle to change. He's saying, here is my struggle in trying to change my life. And I'm just going to say to you before I read it, if Paul struggled with change, don't think that you and I are not going to have to struggle with change. And listen to what he says, Romans 7. I'm going to begin halfway through the chapter, verse 14. I can, and this is the message now, Bible. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, 
I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and, and, and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The Apostle Paul is just being honest. He's saying, I struggle with this thing of change in my life. I know what to do. I know what I should do. I know what I want to do. The only problem is I don't have the power to change. Now, at, in, at the end of chapter 7, let me, let me go back one, one, one word. Let me show this to you in the King James Version a, a couple of verses because it says it in a way that I want you to see it. G going back to verse 22, this is King James saying the same thing the message said right at the end. For I, Paul says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. In other words, my flesh wars against me every time I try to do good. Now, I don't know about you, but I can completely relate to this because I love Jesus. But evidently, all of me doesn't love Jesus. I love the Word of God. You guys know how much I love the Word of God. But not all of me loves the Word of God. I want to do the right thing in my heart. <laughs> But not all of me evidently wants to do the right thing. See, I need to wake up to the reality that part of me will not change. That my fallen flesh is not going to change. And every time I want to do the right thing, it's going to be there to sabotage me. And it's, it's in all of us. And it's going to be there until Jesus comes. You <laughs> see, I, that's why I keep trying to get him here. I mean, I even try to put pressure on him to get him here. He, he still won't come. <laughs> so understand the incorrigible nature of your flesh. And no matter what you do, it's not going to change. All right. So don't get down in the dumps. There's an answer. Number two. Second understanding, understand the purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life. I know that you're aware that when Christ saves your soul, that the Holy Spirit comes into your life. He inhabits you. You become a receptacle that the Holy Spirit houses himself in. So what is the purpose for that? I mean, is, he, is it just because he's the only one that knows the way to heaven? and he's got to take you there one day? I mean, is, what is the purpose for the Holy Spirit? Why is the Holy Spirit in our life? 
Well, at the end of chapter seven, the apostle Paul asked the question, remember, and if you heard it in the, in the King James, he would say, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's really a very poetic way of saying that. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Well, I want to remind you that the book of Romans is a letter, like you, like you write a letter. And, you, and, and it's written, Paul's writing the letter to the church. Well, that just means there are no chapters and verses in the letter. You don't put chapters and verses in your letters, do you? <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 1. How are you? <laughs> Verse two, I hope you are well. Verse three, no, you just write it, right? Well, that's the way Paul did. So what, I, what I'm saying is between chapter seven and eight, I read all of chapter seven and it ended with the, you know, with the question, oh, wretched man that I am, who's gonna deliver me from this body of death? And then the answer comes in chapter 8, first verse, chapter 8. But at one time, remember, they were just all one big passage. They didn't de separate out like that. And, the, and in chapter 8, the first 16 verses of chapter 8, after he's asked the question, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am. In the next 16 verses, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit 15 times. I think we, we see it, we get a pattern there. Remember, we can't change our flesh. It's incorrigible, it's fallen, it's always there to war against us. Therefore, God enters the battle through the person of the Holy Spirit. This is God coming into the battle now with our flesh. This is the purpose for the Holy Spirit indwelling our life. The Apostle Paul says, I've tried everything and I just can't do it. Who's going to save me from this body of death? And here's the answer in, in, in verse 25 of chapter 7. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Verse 1 of chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now look at verse two now. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, by sending his own son in, in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his Spirit who dwells in you. And I'm gonna stop at verse 11 there. But Paul continues throughout the whole chapter to talk to us about the Holy Spirit. So Paul's answer to the question about who is going to save him from this body of death is the grace of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to overcome the flesh and to do the things that God wants us to do. That's what he's saying there. The law is weak because our flesh is weak the law's good, 
but it's not good for us because our flesh is weak and can't keep it. So God did something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus Christ came in the form of our weak flesh and conquered sin. And now the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of us to give us the ability to overcome the flesh that is always with us in our life. You see, God never intended that we would live without this Holy Spirit. Let me, let me just show you. First, when God created man in Genesis 2, look at the first thing God did. Verse 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So God, who is the source of life, takes clay in the ground and forms a man out of it, and then he himself bends down and blows himself into Adam's nostril, placing himself into man. It was not oxygen that God blew into Adam. It was himself that he blew into Adam. And I'll prove it to you in just a second. This is what Jesus meant. You remember this strange little encounter that Jesus had one night with a little Pharisee called Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him at night because he didn't want any of the other Pharisees to see him talking to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, what, am I, what do I need to do to be saved? And he said, you must be born again. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is the Spirit. You must be born again. What was Jesus saying to Nicodemus? You need to enter a second time into your mother's body and come back out the womb again? Is that what he was talking about? No, he said, you were born the first time wrong because you were born without a spirit. Because you were birthed after the nature of your father, Adam, who had the Holy Spirit, but then lost the Holy Spirit when he sinned. So you were born without the spirit the first time the second time, you need to be born with the Spirit. That's what you need to do in order to be saved. So, so Adam is born, is given the Spirit, and then uh, sins against God and loses that Spirit. But now, I'll just remind you, even when he lost that Spirit, he was still walking around breathing oxygen. I mean, he didn't quit breathing. What he lost was the breath of God. This breath of life is mentioned again in connection with Jesus. This is in John 20. Listen to this. John 20, 22. Jesus imparts life to his disciples. He, he breathes. He's God. He breathes on them, just like God the Father did on Adam. Verse 19, John 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. And that's probably what he would have had to say to me if he came through the wall right there. The first thing he would need to say to me is, hey, peace. <laughs> because I think I'd be a little bit out of whack, uh, and I think all of us would be. So he does, with peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw it was the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The word breathe is the word, the Greek word emphusao, from which we get our word emphusao. Uh, emph emphysema. It means the breath of life. So God didn't breathe oxygen into Adam. He breathed his spirit into Adam, and Jesus breathed his spirit, the Holy Spirit, on the disciples. So God never intended mankind to live without being filled with the spirit. 
In Genesis 2, God creates a man and gives him the command and says, of every tree of the garden you can eat freely. But he comes, comes and says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. And when Adam ate of that fruit, the Spirit of God departed from him, but he still had oxygen in his lungs. Man became so depraved. This happened in chapter 4, just as an instant. By Genesis chapter 6, man had become so depraved that God looked at them and God said that there is nothing, the earth is, is full of nothing but violence and corruption. And that's when he started preparing to destroy the earth. Because once Adam lost the spirit of God, man quickly deconstructed to become vile, corruptible, violent creatures. And God had to destroy it and start over again. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we were not designed to live without the power of the Spirit of God in us, and God never intended for us to live that way. And it's really not complicated because there are only two choices about the way you live. In Galatians 5, let me read it to you. Verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, against such there is no law. Verse 18 said, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What does that mean? Well, there's a law of sin inside of every one of us. It's what Paul was talking about in Romans 7. It says that if I walk in the Spirit, then I am not bound by the law of sin and the law of the Spirit of Christ supersedes the law of sin. So if I walk in the, in the Spirit, then I'm not under the law. What law? The law of sin. Because the Spirit overpowers sin. Let me, let me give you this last point. You'll see what I'm talking about. Verse three, I mean, number three, understanding number three. Understand the power of higher law. All right, how, if, I'm gonna, if I have flesh in me all, and, and it's going to be in me, and it's going to be in me forever, and it's always going to be battling with my spirit, and it's never going to change. It's incorrigible. God didn't take it away from me. It's in here, and now I, got, I have two natures in here. I have a sin nature, and then because of the Holy Spirit, and God lives in my life, I have uh, the spirit of life. So now I have two natures in me. So what, what, what's happening? All right, here it is. Understand the power of higher law. There's only one way to escape a lesser law, and that is the application of a higher law. The law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ is the higher law than the law of sin and death. Romans 8, let me read it to you. For the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So now we can be free from the law of sin and death inside of us by the law of the spirit of life. That is, if we walk in the spirit, then we are not in the flesh. Remember, there are only two choices. I can walk in my flesh or I can walk in my spirit. Those are the only two choices that I have. And, 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 and the Lord is saying, if you walk in the power of the Spirit, then you'll overcome the law of sin and death. If you walk in the law of sin and death, then you're not walking in the law of the Spirit. Let me show you how this lives out practically, all right? I, I, I know everybody understands that in your mind. And, and you know, you say, okay, I got you, Pastor. Uh, if I walk with the Lord and I'm saved, then I, my flesh has been crucified and I have the power to overcome the flesh by the Spirit. Okay, but let me just show you what, that, what practically that might mean in just living out something in life. All right, 
everybody <clears throat> talks about willpower, right? I mean, like, okay, if, if I want to do good, I got to have really powerful willpower because I got I to gotta stay on the right track. I got to do the right thing. I got to pay attention. So it, 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 my, my self-discipline, my willpower it, it is, is needed mightily because that's the way I'm going to stay clean. I've got to be self-controlled. I've got to be disciplined. Well, discipline in life is wonderful and it is absolutely, totally necessary in life. And it's a good thing in life. But we know statistically, and, and there are statistics everywhere that tell us that we can't change big areas of our life simply through willpower because we can't make it. Um, look at the, look at the uh, New Year's resolutions every year. And, and, and people put big things. I want to... I want to lose uh, 40 pounds or something like that. I want to uh, read 12 books. I want to graduate from college. I want, whatever it might be, these big areas of life. And even though you have a self-discipline and you have willpower, statistically, it has been proven that willpower only goes so far because willpower is like a rubber band. Have you ever wrapped a rubber band? Uh, have you ever taken like your finger and put a rubber band on there and then put a pencil on it and then just, you just start wrapping the pencil like that and the rubber band? What happens to the rubber band? It starts getting tighter and tighter and tighter, right? Well, after it gets to a certain stress, the rubber band breaks at some point along the way. So think about willpower being like that rubber band. You say, I want to get in shape. And you wake up every day saying, I'm going to get in shape. And so, you, so you start going after, man, getting in shape. And every day uh, you're doing more and more and more and you're getting in shape and you're willing that it would be so and you start losing weight and getting fit. And then one morning they find you dead in the back of a donut shop. You snapped, and after hours, you broke into the donut shop and died of a sugar overdose. You, you couldn't take it anymore. You wound up, and then you snapped. Because we can only go so far by human willpower until we snap. So sometimes, human willpower can even be dangerous in our life. But Paul says, that there's no condemnation to those of us who walk in Christ Jesus. What is he talking about? Condemnation is a word that means no sentence after the judgment. Many people think that when they read that line that says, Paul says, therefore there is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk in Christ Jesus, that what he's talking about is people quit People quit looking down on you. People stop talking about you. People start, stop trying to cancel you on uh, social media. No, that's not condemnation. What this word condemnation means, and, it, and, it's, and it's the Greek word uh, katakrema, it means when you get sentenced by a judge guilty of a crime, there is a sentence that follows the judgment like go to jail. When they slam that door on you in the jailhouse, that is your condemnation. Uh, put him on a cross. When they actually take you and nail you on that cross and you're, lay, you're up there nailed to that cross, that is your condemnation. So the apostle Paul tells us that because of Christ, we have been found guilty, but there is no prison sentence after we have been found guilty because God doesn't expect us to stop sinning. Now, that's where I know you're going, well, Pastor, what are you, 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 you have now like that rubber band you're just talking about. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What is that saying? 
He's saying, look, God knows our flesh. God created us this way. What, what the Psalm says, that God looks on us and says that he knows we're of dust. God pities us like a father pities his son. So it's no surprise to God that we can't stop sinning. What God wants us to do is God wants us to yield to his spirit, not try to stop sinning. I, I know I'm probably making a mess of this, and I, I'm, I, I don't want to confuse you I'm, because I want to show you something that I think will be helpful. When God looks at us, God does not expect us to be able to live without sinning because our flesh is still in us. We're made of flesh. We're, we have weakness in our flesh. If we could stop sinning, Jesus would not have had to come because we could have followed the law and there would have been no reason for Jesus. But the reason God sent Jesus is because he knew we can't stop sinning. So the reason God doesn't give us a, 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 a prison sentence after uh, the, the judgment that, we have, that we're a sinner is because God doesn't expect us to stop sinning. What God does do, God expects us to listen and be led by his Holy Spirit. So we don't spend our whole life trying to stop sinning because we're not. We spend our life listening to the Holy Spirit and following the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit moves us away from sin. Oh, okay, give, give, here's your example. All right, you, you got to wake up every morning, you drink a cup of coffee. Buy your coffee pot, you got uh, a little, one of those little canisters full of cookies. All right, so you come in there and you get your coffee and you say, I'm gonna, I, I need to lose some weight. So I'm not going to get a cookie today. I'm just going to let the cookie go. So now you spend the morning trying to not get one of those cookies because now... Now, the object is uh, uh, not to get one of those cookies. So you, in the afternoon, you know, it gets worse and you, you, you just avoid the kitchen altogether because you know that when you walk into the kitchen that those beady-eyed little cookies are going to be looking out of its canister at you and, and enticing you to come and get him. Well, when you go to bed that night, you're thinking, man, I was. You think about the cookies that you didn't have all day long. Well, the cookies ruined your whole day because you've been thinking about the cookie all day. You've been wanting that cookie all day. You've been trying to resist that cookie all day. But God says, look, you can't live life trying not to eat the cookie. Because if you spend life trying not to eat the cookie, your life is going to be consumed with one thing, trying not to eat the cookie. And that's going to become the sum total of your life. But God says, I, if you walk after me, I'm going to change you. Because all of us have two things inside of us. All right, when, we get, when, when Christ comes into our life, what do we get? Well, according to Galatians 5, 23, 22 and 23, we get love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. That's what we get when Jesus comes into us. So let's talk about two of those things. Let's talk about goodness, and let's talk about self-control. Because every one of us have two switches in our life, if you want to think about it this way. We have a wanter switch, and we have a canter switch. Goodness means you want the right things. To be good means I want the right things. So if you're wanting bad things, what is the problem? The problem is my wanter switch is flipped in the wrong direction. It needs to be flipped back in the right direction. And so the Holy Spirit comes into my life 
in order to be able to control the wanter switch in my life. So your wanter says this, and you want to do it, but you have a weak canter switch. So what affects the canter switch in your life? Oh, the Holy Spirit brings self-control into your life so that you can, if you want to change that canter switch, what does he tell you to do? In Hebrews 4, he says, all right, come to the throne of grace that you might find grace, mercy, mercy in time of need and grace before it's too late. So God gives us his power, his Holy Spirit to change my wonder and to change my canter. And, and I don't want to wrestle with my flesh all day long for the rest of my life. I don't want to, I don't want to wrestle to have righteous desires. Uh, I don't want to fight to try to have self-control so I can do the things that I need to. So every single day, God says that he will give me the grace to affect my Warner switch and the grace to affect my Cantor switch if I will just walk in his spirit. And I won't fall subjection, subject to a lesser law, which is the law of sin, and spend my life trying to fight sin rather than to spend my life serving him. And you know when you'll come to the point where you'll ask for it? <laughs> when I, I came to this point, when I came to this point, let me just say this. I came to a point where I had to ask for it. You know when you'll come to the point when you had that? Probably the same place I did. When you, when you finally realize you don't have a snowball chance in the 4th of July of making it without him. Just like the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7. Look, if the Apostle Paul can't make it without the power of God changing the law of sin and death in his life, what makes us think we're going to be able to do that? We're all in the same boat. And if the Apostle Paul couldn't manage his flesh, we're not going to manage our flesh either. It's going to have to be overtaken with a greater law. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. All right. Hopefully that's been, and, it's, and it comes because of his grace. Hopefully that's been helpful to you and God has spoken to you about things in your life. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the things that we do. It's the things that we are. It's, the, it's what happens in our life that, that matters to us. Uh, all of the theology and all of the understanding and all of the histories and all of those things, it's, it's great to know that. It's wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to know all of those kind of things. But the reason why is so that you can understand simply how God works in your life. Not, not in, he's not a magician. He's not a, a circus, three-ring circus uh, master. You know, he, he doesn't, it's not bizarro world we're here. It's, it's our life. And, and as you walk with him and allow you the spirit of God to, run, to move in your life, he moves you away from things that harm you and lead you to things that are good for you. And, and it's an ebb and flow day by day of God just working gently in your life through his grace to carry you through life so that your life can be blessed and you can accomplish the purpose. And that's really simply all, all it is. So I'm gonna ask you if you...